my group is interested in focal epilepsy. So epilepsies can occur as general epilepsy where the problem is in all of the brain at the same time. Or epilepsy can arise um, from a single region and that can cause seizures. Um, focal epilepsy is a little bit milder in some cases, but it's extremely common. And there are actually a good percentage of focal epilepsy cases that can't be treated adequately with medications. So we know an epilepsy is focal by a couple of the different things. So one, we have to see um, an abnormality on the EEG that's on one side or another side, but not both. And the abnormality in firing has to be persistent on one side, it can't switch. A lot of times we get more additional information from looking at functional imaging and from doing an MRI on the patient. So if we can see a region that doesn't look totally normal and that correlates with a region on the EEG, then uh, we can be pretty sure that that epilepsy is focal. The other thing that's uh, different about focal epilepsy uh, in, compar in comparison to generalized epilepsies is that focal epilepsy isn't usually inherited. A lot of generalized epilepsies are from gene mutations in membrane proteins or in channels. Focal epilepsy just arises, you know, and it can arise from other medical conditions like a stroke or a tumor. In the pediatric population, though, it's usually um, a problem with early development just in one uh, spot on the brain. And so the thing about it is that it's hard for clinicians um, to know how to treat focal epilepsy specifically. So we usually give medications and we don't know whether some focal epilepsies would respond better to some medications or others. What my group did was that we took surgical cases from focal epilepsy patients. These are patients who are getting that um, abnormal part of their brain removed just to control their seizures. Um, and this is done as a therapeutic measure. It's not done for research purposes, obviously. As a byproduct of the surgery, we can take the epileptogenic tissue and we can run large-scale studies on it. We started this a couple of years ago. We started collecting tissue from um, these surgical cases, right? And then after we had about 10 or so, we ran um, a large-scale analysis, a genomic analysis on it. It's called a microarray, and it profiles expression patterns all throughout uh, the genome. And we found a ton of changes um, across different types of focal epilepsy cases. But when we looked at what genes were in common, it looked like there were about 900 genes that uh, were in common to all fo types of focal epilepsy cases. And when we stratified those genes in terms of how tightly regulated they were, the clock protein, or the clock gene, actually came out on top. So it seems that in uh, focal uh, epilepsy tissue that there's a huge decrease in clock expression. So clock is a circadian transcription factor, right? So in other parts of the brain, it regulates the sleep-wake cycle. It's interesting because the levels of clock oscillate, right? So you go up and then they go down. So whatever clock is regulating, you know, may be actually reversible. So we thought this was like a really interesting pathway to study for epilepsy. You know, just in case, you know, we could find some defects that we could actually fix. But we had to go a long way before we were ready to get there. One of our first studies was to figure out what um, cell type was actually expressing clock. And so it turns out that both excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons express clock. And they kind of do the, the opposite thing in the brain, right? Excitatory versus inhibitory. And so we really needed to know whether the, the clock problem was more of an excitatory problem or inhibitory problem. So we turned to mouse genetics to figure that out. So using um, a mouse genetic technique, we could actually take the clock gene out 
of either only excitatory neurons or only inhibitory neurons. And when we did that, we found that just the deletion from the excitatory neurons actually changed the seizure threshold for the mouse. So now we know that it's actually the loss of clock in excitatory neurons that's probably pathogenic for the focal epilepsy tissue. It's, I mean, it's a big leap, but <laughs> it's a beginning. What it means for human patient care is that we have a pathway now that we can target to try to fix, to maybe make um, their seizures less severe, maybe make um, the circuits uh, less dysfunctional, and so that maybe we can prevent like progression of epilepsy. We can prevent you know epilepsy that gets worse and worse and worse as more seizures occur. I like the pathway. I think it's very promising, um, not only because you know we can study it in the mouse, but also because of what I said before, the re reversibility aspects. You know, in other parts of the body, all the clock changes you know happen on a daily basis, and they can be fixed. So that's why we think it, it's an important pathway. There's a high percentage of patients who just have seizures at night or have seizures during the day. And you know, you, one can think that if the circadian pathway is actually functioning to regulate seizure threshold, that might be important for this. Every stage of life is different in terms of epilepsy treatment. And you know, there are advantages and disadvantages of being a physician to each and to being a patient you know, with epilepsy at every stage in life. And the good thing about children is that they have parents. <laughs> so treating epilepsy in kids is really like a whole family affair. I think the next step is twofold. So one is we know that clock is a transcription factor. It regulates a multitude of other genes. So we have to hone our hypothesis down to figure out what are the downstream targets that are actually important for epilepsy. We have candidates. We're working on that. The other thing is that there are pharmaceutical agents that can alter clock function. And we are trying to bring those on board to see if we can alter, you know, that we can fix the clock changes that we see.